and you know, and many horrible people in the Bible did. God changed their hearts. They were evil, and God changed them. So let's not forget to pray for our enemies. Why is it important to stand with Israel? Should Israel stop fighting for the defense of its territory and its citizens? Israel is being shaken like no other time in modern history, but we know that God is for them. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. Today, we present Joel's message that he gave at the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast and the importance of prayer during these challenging times. Well, it's an honor to be with you, and uh, it's an honor to live here, and it's an honor to have gone through the horrors of October 7th and every day since with our people. Many of you know that I'm Jewish on my father's side. I'm not Jewish on my mom's side, so some here in Israel don't consider me Jewish. That's fine. But the Jewish agency did, (laughs) and uh, the state of Israel did, and so we were able to make Aliyah uh, 10 years ago. We arrived on August 15th, 2014, and in that month, 4,200 rockets were fired from Gaza by Hamas uh, at Israel, and this was sort of our, you know, almost literal baptism by fire of coming into the country. And um, it's been a challenge ever since, but it's a, it's an honor and a joy. And uh, it's a real, I really appreciate uh, Albert and Heli and the entire team that has put on this Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast all these years in so many countries with so much impact, mobilizing prayer, educating believers. And I think there's never been more, a more important moment than now. And for you to all come about 400 of you from all over the world, when you didn't know exactly what would be happening, you didn't even know if the airport would be open, you didn't know if missiles would be flying and that you'd be diverted, as many flights have been over the last uh, eight months, but you came. And uh, as important as it is to stand with Israel in all of your countries, what a joy to stand in Israel, or in this case, sit, I realize you're sitting, but uh, you know, metaphorically, spiritually, and uh, in every other way, you are standing with Israel. This is super important. But not only to love and bless Israel, but, you know, God does command us to love Israel's neighbors. This requires us to have a heart of compassion on the Palestinians, being clear-eyed, to be sure. But we're supposed to. We're commanded to love our enemies, love our neighbors, and love our enemies. That's challenging, never more so than now. So we really have to be looking to the Lord to show us. How do you do that? How do you do that? And... um, It's also critical that we put all that we're seeing and all that we're hearing over the last eight months in a biblical context and particularly in a prophetic context. And that's what I want to do here, walk you through some scriptures. You know, many of you are certainly in this room, you're familiar with these scriptures, but I think it's important to re-look at them one by one in context of where we are right now right now in prophetic history, right now in the history of this particular war that began on October 7th, and honestly right now seems to have no end in sight, okay? There will be an end. None of us, I think, can say how this is going to end. And we are facing attack from every single sector, okay? Yes, we're we're in a, a massive battle inside Gaza. We're in a massive battle that's getting worse every day with Hezbollah, the terrorist organization in Lebanon. The attacks on that border are going up, 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 up. We're in a a war with the Houthis who are firing ballistic missiles, you know, almost 1,800 kilometers into Eilat and our southern cities. We are facing infiltration of terrorists from Jordan and from Syria. We are, you know, my home with my wife here in Jerusalem, we happen to face east. We face Jordan. We can see Judea and Samaria. We can, well, Judea, at least. We can't see Samaria from our apartment, but we can see Jordan, the lights of Jordan, the hills of Jordan, the mountains of Jordan, right from our backyard. So how surreal it was a few weeks ago to see dozens of Iranian ballistic missiles and suicide drones coming from the east over the Temple Mount, over the Dome of Rock, over our home, and being exploded, intercepted by various Israeli interception systems over our home. 
and feel the concussion each time those explosions occur. But see, some of them continue past our, our line of sight and continue south. This is not normal. Even in the, you know, I've been coming here for 37 years when I first studied at Tel Aviv University as a, a junior, or uh, yeah, junior in, at Syracuse University, studying filmmaking, studying storytelling, studying communications. I came here for six months. The first intifada broke out while I was here. So I've been coming in and out of this country for almost four decades and have lived here as a citizen for one decade, and I've never seen anything like what's happened over the last eight months. This is Israel's darkest hour, at least since the War of Independence in 19. 19- 48, which was existential. Now this feels existential. I'm not sure if it is existential yet, but it's grim. And it's not just the kinetic war that we're facing on every angle, right? It's the war by uh, the International Criminal Court, right? Saying that we're the committers of genocide. This is, this is insane, but this is what we're facing. This, uh, the ICC indicting our prime minister and defense minister as we defend ourselves against Hamas, which is literally in their, and explicitly in their own 1988 charter, focused on committing genocide here in Israel. Yet, it is our prime minister and our defense minister who are, have been indicted and are going to be arrested. Even the Germans have said if, they, if the prime minister or defense minister lands in Germany, they will arrest them. The Germans, who have been quite supportive of us, i got to say, but this is, we're in a very dangerous moment. President Biden at times is with us, and he deserves credit for the, those times. It's very important, whether it's diplomatic or plane loads of, of arms and, 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 and ammunition and resupply, and, and yet he's trying to force us to stop fighting. He's imposing arms embargoes on us to not finish the job in Rafa, the southernmost city. And he's saying explicitly, look, I support Israel. I, I want them to win. I just will not support them going into Rafa. This is schizophrenic. Now, I'm not, that's not a medical diagnosis. I'm just giving a political analysis. These two things do not go together. And President Biden is the best that the Democratic Party has. So we, on the one hand, don't want to think that we're going to get better. I'm not making a partisan Point. I'm making an anal- analytical point that he's the most pro-Israel person in the entire, at least senior echelons of the Democratic Party. And look how conflicted he is over truly standing with us. And I could go on and on, but I, I, I don't want to do that. What I, I, I want to walk you through some scriptures, but I want to say one other thing um, as, we, as we look at these scriptures, and that is this. Over the last eight months, from my unique vantage point, you all have your vantage points, that prayer, writing about these things, maybe you're in the media, uh, there's a whole range of ways. You're preaching, you're teaching, you're bringing solidarity groups here, um, you're mobilizing people to you know, pray in cell groups all over, you're, you're working online, you're fighting in, the, uh, in, in diplomatic arenas, in legal arenas, and God bless you for this. Don't stop. In our tiny slice of this world, our focus has been communications, education, through all Israel news and all Arab news, and as was mentioned through uh, my weekly uh, primetime show on TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, which is the most watched. It's not the only Christian network in the United States, obviously, but it's the most watched Christian network, and it didn't do news and analysis for many, many decades, and only in the last few years has it decided to do so. And one of the things Matt Crouch, the head of TBN, asked me is, would you create a weekly primetime news and analysis show, analysis show in Jerusalem about Israel and the region? And I said, Matt, I have a face for radio. I don't know that you really want me on television every week, but he, uh, he prevailed upon me. And so we've been covering this war from all of these angles. I've been inside Gaza with an embedded IDF unit, going into Khan Yunus, going into actual terror tunnels that were newly discovered, walking into cages where at least a dozen Israeli hostages, including the youngest, Kifar Bibis, captured at only nine months, passed his one-year birthday there, a beautiful, adorable, little red-headed boy. He was in that cage. They have DNA evidence. But they were all moved just... Hours, days, we're not sure, before the IDF came fighting in to capture those tunnels. 
No reporter had ever seen those tunnels before. And Chris Mitchell, my dear colleague from CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, and I, along with a few other uh, international journalists, Israeli journalists, were able to go in and stand in that cage and then stand in the lair of Yahya Sinwar, the demon-possessed leader of Hamas in Gaza. Just extraordinary to have a, uh, an invitation to go into the epicenter of evil. We prayed in those tunnels together as brothers. And when we came out, we prayed for the hostages, we prayed for our troops, we prayed for the capture, kill, and conversion of all the Hamas people. Not necessarily in that order, but if they won't come to faith in Jesus. And you know, and many horrible people in the Bible did. God changed their hearts. They were evil, and God changed them. So let's not forget to pray for our enemies. But one way or the other, they need to be captured or they need to be killed. Then we came out of those tunnels and we were just about to get back in the armored personnel carrier to go out of Gaza. How surreal is that? Wake up in Jerusalem, kiss your wife goodbye, get in a car, drive an hour and a half, put on a helmet and a flak jacket, get in an armored personnel carrier, drive an hour and 15 minutes in and then go into the epicenter of evil, cover it, and then go home, take a shower, kiss your wife, sit down and have dinner. It's a different planet, and it's only two hours from my home. It's a different planet. It's a different universe. It's evil. It's tyranny. It's terror, and there's freedom. God bless Chris Mitchell, because just before we left, he said, hey, you want to take communion? I said, what? And he said, it was almost like he was like, hey, I got communion crackers, and I brought grape juice. Wow, I didn't even think of this. God bless an older brother in, in faith in Jesus to think of that. And sure enough, we took communion, we bowed our heads, we took the Lord's Supper in Gaza, in Khan Yunus. And we prayed, Lord, would you break the stranglehold of Satan in this entire Gaza Strip? Would you give victory to our troops? Would you give protection and redemption to our, and of course, uh, freedom to all those who are held hostage? Would you set the captives free according to Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3? And would you bring salvation to everyone in Gaza and everyone in Israel? To imagine standing on that ground, unholy, blood-soaked, defiled ground, and have that opportunity. We've had the opportunity over the last eight months to sit down with Prime Minister Netanyahu in his office in the, in the Kiria, the Pentagon of Israel. We've, we've sat with the victims of of these terrible atrocities. I was just a few days ago with Nikki Haley in three border communities just meeting with people who had gone through these traumas. I've interviewed parents who've lost their children in battle. We've interviewed pastors all over the country who are living on the front lines, living in the midst of this and serving the Lord and seeing Israelis struggling. Do I even believe in God anymore if they're religious or unreligious, secular, thinking, I need to be reading the Psalms. I, start, I need to start reading the Bible. I've never read it before. It's really an interesting spiritual dynamic going on here, and we're trying to cover those things, again, on All Israel News, All Arab News, and the Rosenberg Report. And I, I hope those are resources that will be helpful to you. Uh, I also mentioned the work of the Joshua Fund and providing humanitarian relief and other types of financial and, and other type of support to ministries that are caring for people in real time in the worst moment that we've ever experienced in, in our lifetime. And the Josh Fund's only 18 years old, and it feels like everything that we've learned and the mistakes we've made, on the improvements and corrections we've made by God's mercies are, ne are needed right now, right? So those are some of the things we've been doing. But as I've been asked to teach and speak around the country over the last eight months, I want to share with you some of the things I've been sharing with them. Let me begin by saying that um, a few weeks ago I was invited to uh, preach at a, the congregation that happens to be located on Mount Carmel. Very, very interesting, and, uh, and that northern border really heating up. And I, and I taught uh, on lessons from the prophet Amos, and I'll just mention a few things. I want to mention from Amos chapter 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Okay, there was a massive earthquake, but this was these visions and this scripture was written prior to that. 
And the Lord spoke uh, through Amos, this prophet who was not, as he says later in the text, right? I, I'm not actually a prophet by, you know, background or, uh, you know, the Lord called me, but I, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of prophets, but the Lord called me to say things. And so I'm doing it. What a faithful man. But the, in verse two, uh, he says, the Lord roars from Zion and from Jerusalem, he utters his voice. And it goes down in verse three, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. And then a few moments later, in verse 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. It goes on to say in verse 7, I will, uh, God says, I will send fire upon the walls of Gaza. I will con- it will consume her citadels. And it goes on, uh, the remnant of the Philistines will perish, says the Lord God. And he, he describes judgment. Now, those prophecies are fulfilled, that, specific, you know, that section of Amos. There are prophecies uh, that are yet to be fulfilled from Amos, but we can learn lessons. You know, I think God has only mentioned about 20 times in the Bible, only once positively. That happens to be in the book of Acts when Philip is sent there to share the gospel of Jesus the Messiah with an Ethiopian uh, treasury official who is heading on the road to Gaza. And uh, that man um, beautifully and miraculously comes to faith in Jesus. That's the only positive mention of Gaza. There's a lot of heartbreak. There's a lot of uh, horror, and there's a lot of sin uh, in that area. And And I think it's important to say up front, A, we're supposed to love our neighbors. We must. We're commanded. This is not a suggestion. Look, it'll be nice. Jesus is not saying, ah, you know, find a little room in your heart. Just He commands us, love your neighbors. Now you say, but they're not our neighbors. They're our enemies. Fine. Jesus says, love your enemies. Come on, Lord. That capture, that, that's everybody. I mean, aren't you giving us any room of people we can't love? <laughs> and of course, the answer is no. Now, it's important that he says you can understand a person as an enemy, right? He's not, the Lord is not confused. He's not saying, look, uh, you're, they're just misunderstood. No, they're enemies. Okay? Now, not everybody in Gaza is an enemy. Some are neighbors, and they're trapped in a system that they can't get out of. Did they vote for Hamas 18 years ago, 19, 17 years ago? Yes, they did. Have they had another election since? No, they haven't. Is almost every apartment and every home in, in, in Gaza filled with weapons and ammunition and often terrorists and rocket launchers? Yes. Unfortunately, yes. I've, I've interviewed commanders who, and, and soldiers who told me, house by house, room by room, you would not believe, we, we did not believe that in every home, or almost every home, we would find this. And, and this is why the destruction is so bad, because things are booby-trapped, and they decide once they clear the house, we're not, or the apartment building, we're not going to tr- send troops in to try to figure out how to defuse every single bomb and every single booby trap. We're going to blow it up. And this is why you see destruction as far as the eye can see. Now, understanding this prophetically, right, we all know from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God's blessing to, and his covenant with Abraham and through the rest of the scriptures to Isaac, to Jacob, on through to today. This is an eternal covenant. It's an unbreakable covenant. It's an unconditional covenant. There is a peace that is conditional. Um, those who bless Israel, I will bless. We like to focus on that part, and it's good to focus on that part. But there is a consequence of cursing Israel. Those who curse Israel, God says he will curse. Now, it doesn't mean a person is not redeemable, You know, I've interviewed on my show Iranian Shia Muslims who hated Israel, hated America, hated Christianity, and God has supernaturally transformed them, right? But if you curse Israel for 76 years straight, there are consequences, okay? There just are. And I believe we're watching the judgment of God. Now, we're not supposed to rejoice in it. We're supposed to pray that the Lord would use this in some way to wake up the people of Gaza, to Set off, to cast off the spirit of Islam, the spirit of radical Islamism, and, and the spirit of apocalyptic Islamism, and to say, this has failed us. We're on the wrong team. And to turn and give their lives to Jesus the Messiah. This needs to be our prayer. And I believe God will do this, but I believe we're seeing the judgment of God. And that's a painful reality in our life. Our verse of the day is Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me 
because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Please join us in praying fervently that God would break the stranglehold of Satan in the Gaza Strip and that he would give victory to his people. Pray that the Israeli captives would be set free and that God would bring salvation to everyone in Gaza and Israel. Now, I don't believe we're seeing the judgment of Israel right now. I believe we're seeing the shaking of Israel. I, I, uh, Amos speaks to this too, Amos 9.9, 9, right? God famously says through the prophet Amos, I will shake the house of Israel among the nations. Okay, This is the moment that we're in. Israel is being shaken like no other time in our modern history. Again, at least since 48. I just interviewed, and it'll, it'll show this summer in a series of shows on the Rosenberg Report, one of the last living original Jewish believers in Jesus, Israeli believers in Jesus, that was alive in 1948. We know there were only 23 of them at the time. This man, Arya Bar David, was a, a young boy, like about a year old at that point, but his family of seven, they are seven of the 23 that they were the only Jewish believers in Jesus in the entire country when God prophetically gave rebirth to the country in 1948. It's pretty amazing. Those who are left, we have had the joy of getting to know. And this, uh, just a few weeks ago, we did hours of interviews with Arye, and that's going to be a multi-part series coming up this summer. So you can hear and see from a man who's been here. He's 76, he's 77, and the country's 76. It's, it's really amazing. He's fought in every war since 1967. And his spiritual perspective his prophetic understanding of what's going on is extraordinary, and yet most people have never heard of him, so it's a joy to be able to not only sit with someone like that, but share them with believers all over the world. We are being shaken. Uh, we're being shaken because Israel has forgotten that we have a good shepherd, right? This is what David taught us. Set aside the New Testament for the moment, right? David, the first king of Israel 3,000 years ago, tells us, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, and yet... When a nation like Israel, and particularly the nation of Israel, who was chosen by God to know him and to make him known, when Israel, when Jews forget that we have a shepherd and we think either there isn't a shepherd or it doesn't really even matter to stick with the shepherd, I can be a sheep that goes astray. It's a, I don't need to pay attention to my shepherd. This is, of course, a dangerous instinct and it's, a, it's potentially a fatal flaw. And what we've watched here is a nation that mostly doesn't know God or care about God. And that is painful to be a part of a society like that, though we are heading towards a Romans 11, 26 world where all Israel will be saved. But we are not anywhere close to that yet. There's only about 30,000 Jewish and Arab believers in Jesus in the entire country right now. It's a country of 10 million people. So do the math. We're, we're just a smidge away from all Israel being saved. So we've got a lot of prayers to do, a lot of work to, to, to be faithful. But what's interesting is if you wander away from your shepherd or you're not aware that there is a shepherd, you, 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 the problem is that it, it's not a, just a neutral environment. You can't just roam the countryside and think, oh, I, you know, it might be better to be with a shepherd, but it doesn't really matter. It matters because the Bible is filled with descriptions of the ravenous wolves and the brutal beasts that are out there waiting to attack and eat us, devour us. So it, there's not a, it, so there's a consequence. I don't believe that's judgment right now. I believe that's a consequence. And I believe the Lord is shaking the whole house of Israel to get people to wake up. Nikki Haley was chatting with a, a young woman in her 20s, totally secular, who was a survivor on October 7th at the Nova Music Festival, but listened to her friends and, and, and brothers and sisters all around her being tortured, being murdered, being sexually assaulted and raped, not just women, men as well. She witnessed this. It's, I said, Why did, how did you survive? She said, it's a miracle. Well, first she, in the conversation, she said luck. Later she said, it was God. I said, okay, well, are you from a religious background? No, I'm not. So do you see it as luck or do you see it as God? Well, I, 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 I think I'm saying that, she said, uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but, um, and we'll have the story in the next few days on All Israel News, but she said, I, 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 I would have thought it was luck, 
from who I am before, but now I think it might be God. And she said, when I was able to reach a trailer where some of the operations people were based, and I hid in there, and for some reason, Hamas terrorists didn't storm in and kill us all, I found somebody else's mobile phone. She said her phone was, had died. She found another mobile phone, and she said, I should have been texting my family and friends, telling them I'm okay, at least so far. Instead, I was Googling the Psalms. She said, I've never read the Psalms before. I've never read the Bible before. But that was my first instinct. God is shaking people here. And I've sat with Orthodox Jews who are like, I'm done. If this is what God lets happen to our country, I'm out. I can't pray. I don't want any part of that God. Orthodox Jews, keep on wearing. And I've met with secular people who have never thought about God a day in their life who are like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm far away from God. I need to get to God. I need to find him. It's a very interesting dynamic going on. Um, now, God says he's also going to shake all the nations. And, we are, and you know, as has been mentioned here, God is shaking the nations and forcing or requiring nations to choose. Are you in or out? Are you with Israel or out? Are you a sheep nation or a goat nation? This is part of Bible prophecy playing out. Now, another Bible prophecy, of course, that we need to look at is, is from Matthew 24, where Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, is saying that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, Right. And you'll be hearing about this, and you'll be experiencing it. Nations will rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There'll be various earthquakes. I mean, God's going to literally allow the, the nations of the earth, including Israel, to be physically shaken, emotionally shaken, financially shaken, politically shaken, but most importantly, spiritually shaken. And he says, these are merely the beginnings of the birth pangs. Now, I'm a father of four boys. We have all boys. We, we did not get the spiritual gift of raising teenage daughters, okay? The Lord obviously looked at my wife and me and said, I, I don't think that's going to be a good idea. So we got boys, and we love these boys, and we're very grateful for them. I will just say, you know, as somebody who didn't give birth, um, I, of course, didn't experience those birth pangs the same way as my wife did. So I'm not saying that I did. So all the women, I don't want to see some big rebellion and a, you know, rush the stage. You don't even know. I don't know. All I know is my hand being squeezed until there was no blood left. You're like, yeah, whatever. Okay, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I began to experience what, I, I began to watch what was she was going through. I was watching, in a minor way, what I was going through, and I was watching that monitor, right? Because that, that birth pain went up, 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 you know, I, you know, that's the most pain. And then I began to see it ease off. I could see that she was beginning to, it, you know. so birth pains are contraction and release. Contraction and release, right? And then the closer you get to the point of delivery, of arrival, the contractions are longer and more intense, and the release periods are shorter. You have less time to catch your breath before the next one kicks in longer and harder. Clearly, our world is going through birth pangs, right? And you can certainly say that about all of the 20th century. You can certainly say it about now, but I would just give you two examples. Uh, three, let's say. I would say COVID was a global birth pang. Regardless what you think of medically or politically about COVID, the world went through a contraction and the amount of power that nations took from their people immediately, travel, the ability to step outside your house, what you had to put in your arm, and of course churches being allowed to be open or not while strip clubs, you know, bars, you know, had no issues, at least not in the United States. So this was a contraction. Russia's invasion of Ukraine a massive contraction. This is the largest war in Europe since World War II, and it's going on, and the, the, the amount of death and destruction is, is incalculable. This is a major contraction. But as of October 6th, Israel felt like we were in a release. That's why there was fewer than 400 soldiers on that border. And mostly there were young Girls, 18, 19, 20, serving in the IDF, watching monitors, keeping an eye on the border. It was basically an unguarded border. Why? How was that even possible? That's for an investigation and a conversation longer than we have today. But the, the basic concept was Israel felt in a release. It did not feel like they were in a birth pang, and they certainly didn't think like a birth pang was imminent. We had just signed four Arab-Israeli peace treaties with the Abraham Accords, right? Last year, we were celebrating that, and we were saying, may God have the next one happen with Saudi Arabia. Well, that's what was building all year, and by August, October 6th, we thought, wow, we, we are within striking distance, within maybe within the next few months, a, a, a game-changing deal with Saudi Arabia is going to happen. 
Now, that didn't mean we shouldn't guard our border, our southern border, nor should America, by the way. But that's the mentality, the mindset. We're, you know, Hamas is really not a threat anymore. Things are changing. We're being welcomed into the region. By the way, remember last year we, we prayed, not only do we want to have, you know, one of the next Jerusalem prayer breakfasts in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and I'm, I would love to work on that with Albert and Heli, having had a chance to spend time with the crown prince over the last few years, but also in Iran. Remember the crown prince of Iran had just been here last year, Reza Pahlavi, the son of the Shah that was overthrown and driven out of the country. He had just come and he, I had interviewed him uh, for the Rosenberg Report and he told me point blank, I want to make a peace treaty like what's been happening with the Arab world, but I want to call them the Cyrus Accords because in our history, Cyrus was the guy who loved the Jews and let the Jews leave Persia and go back to here to Israel and rebuild their temple and we help pay for it from Iran. Like, preach it, brother. I mean, you know, I'm, so anyway, he's not maybe a brother in Jesus, but yeah, may he be the next leader and I would love to go uh, cover his arrival and, uh, and his leadership of, of Iran. And there are prophecies, Jeremiah 49, that says God is going to judge the leaders of Iran, and then it says he's going to move his throne to Iran. Uh, the, the ancient term was Elam, E-L-A-M. And I'm like, well, uh, Lord, excuse me, excuse me. I uh, got a little, uh, <laughs> you know, judge's ruling here. Uh, aren't you moving your throne here? To Jerusalem? Like, aren't you setting up a temple uh, and you're going to reign from here over the entire planet? Of course he's going to do that. But before that, uh, he says he's going to move his throne to Iran, which means spiritually, I believe the Shia radical country that's our worst enemy is going to become the, a fount of many blessings. So many Shia Muslims in Iran are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ, and they are going to be gospel preaching radicals all over the planet. They are going to be the Apostle Saul turned into the Apostle Paul. Millions of Iranian Shias coming to faith in Jesus and being just as radical for Jesus as they have been against Jesus and against Jews. This is something to look forward to. Amen. So, so we're in birth pangs. October 6th, release here in Israel. October 7th and since, and we can barely breathe. I mean, maybe you would say right this moment, like it, the, the, the birth pang is still on, but it's, it's, it's lightened just enough that Israelis feel like they can breathe a little bit, but we're expecting another contraction on the Lebanon border. Just a few others um, that I want to highlight. There's a point, Bible prophecy tells us, that all nations are going to abandon Israel, right? We're moving towards an Ezekiel 38, 39 conflict, right? Where Russia and Iran and Turkey and a number of other countries will, will come and surround Israel in the last days, God told the prophet Ezekiel, and Everyone will fear here in Israel that our demise is imminent, that we will be wiped off the face of the planet as this uh, evil coalition comes to invade, conquer, and destroy. Now, we're not there yet, but a lot of the preconditions for Ezekiel 38 and 39 are increasingly lining up. The Russian-Iranian alliance was, has been building for the last 20 years. You know I, I've written and spoken a lot about this but never more so than during the Ukraine-Russia war. Because as the world has turned against Russia and cut off money and all kinds of embargoes and sanctions, who's coming to Putin's rescue? It's Iran, providing weapons that Russia desperately needs. This is a problem. I don't want to get into Russia, Ukraine, US, international politics in this, but I do want to say Vladimir Putin, people ask me all the time, do you think Vladimir Putin is Gog, biblical Gog? And my answer is, I don't know. He's Gog-esque, but is he really him? I, I don't know. But could he be? Yes. And I think one of the things as you study Ezekiel 38 and 39, what you find is once that coalition comes and surrounds Israel, not a single country comes to Israel's defense. Let's be clear, it's, it's not the same as what happens in Zechariah and Revelation and other passages where all nations come against Israel to attack Israel in the end of days. But in this case, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which explicitly says it will happen in the last days, it's clear that no nation comes to Israel's defense. Israel's abandoned. Every, so that means at some point, America is going to abandon Israel. Now, when I, I've taught this for, for 20 years, and most of the time over the last 20 years, even people who are interested in this prophecy 
but aren't you know, real students of it necessarily, and far too few pastors and ministry leaders are teaching Bible prophecy, that, that's a problem, right? 27% uh, of the Bible is prophecy, and so when you don't teach it, people don't know 27% of what God wants them to know. That's not a good formula for a healthy believer or a healthy church, right? If you, if you have a son or daughter and you teach them 27% less of what they need to know to drive a car safely, are they going to be safe? What about the other people on the road? Let's say you run a medical school and you teach your students 27% less of what they need to save a life. Who's benefiting here? Well, that's too controversial. We don't want to get into it. It's too political. It's too crazy. Crazy people teach prophecy. Yeah, unfortunately, there are some. But there are people preaching false gospels. We don't say, well, I'm not going to preach the gospel. There's crazy people preaching the gospel. I don't want to be linked with them. No, because there is false gospels being taught, preached, believed, we all the more we need to teach the truth in love. And the same thing is true about prophecy. But most people don't know these prophecies. And so just to tie that up, Israel is going to be abandoned. And if you look at the preconditions for Israel uh, and a war of Gog and Magog, uh, so many of those pieces are in place. Russia, Iran, Turkey, all these countries that are explained as being part of the coalition are forming an alliance. Now, some people have said uh, privately, publicly, we are, we are in that moment. I, I, I want to be cautious about that. I don't think we can say that. And we, can't, we can't rule it out. October 7th isn't in Ezekiel 38. What's described there is these countries form this coalition. Israel's incredibly prosperous, and it's secure. People feel secure. Now, you could say, well, Israel wasn't completely secure. Look what happened on the 7th. Right, but look at how people felt on the 6th. In God's economy, in his sovereign understanding of things, is it possible that, is, that October 6th checked a box of Israel feeling secure, feeling prosperous, and therefore feel, feeling invulnerable, even as Russia and Iran and Turkey and these other countries do form an alliance? Is that possible? Did that box just get checked? And if so, could the events we're seeing lead in the coming weeks, months, maybe years, Russia and Iran saying, we're coming to finish the job. You invade Rafa, you commit genocide, we're coming to make things right. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Is, is it playing out the way the scriptures say at the moment? Well, no, in the sense that it doesn't say first, or, or between prosperity and security, and the alliance that's building against us, there's going to be this convulsion that looks like what we've seen. But that doesn't mean it's not part of it. And I can't tell you right now. I really think it's important for us to, to be cautious in our analysis because I can see two scenarios. I can see a trajectory where, as the world is clearly turning against Israel, and Israel's being increasingly abandoned, even at, on, depending on the day and the hour from the White House, I can see a scenario which this thing builds to a crescendo and people say, we must stop the genocide that Israel is you know, fomenting against the Palestinians. We must get them out of uh, Rafah. They are no longer legitimate and maybe they'll do the right thing if we pressure them. Let's build a military coalition and surround them, right? Russia in the tax, Gog, the leader of Gog, uh, the, the leader Gog, the evil dictator of Russia, he's not even proactively thinking about Israel. God is pulling him, the hooks and the jaws, pulling him into a conflict to bring judgment on Russia. Now, having come from a family where my father's side escaped out of Russia because of anti-Semitism, and looking at all the Jews that have been killed, all the Christians that have been persecuted, and now what Vladimir Putin has been up to for the last 24 years, and including the last 24 months, could judgment be far off? I think it's deserved, but I, you know, we also need to pray for the Russian people. My point is, could I imagine that the Iranians are going to say, look, we have helped you, Mr. Putin. We've given you weapons. We've given you, we've stood with you. It's time for you to come with us and you need to step out of the shadows. Are you with us as your ally or are you with Israel? It's time to choose. So could I picture that happening? I can. Do I have time to write a novel about it? No. 
But I'll analyze it on all Israel News and <laughs> the Rosenberg Report and so forth. But I can also see a scenario in which in the next six months, one year, whatever the time frame is, that God gives Israel a dramatic win. That right now, though it seems so murky and so painful, and it is, can I see a scenario in which we have a big win in Gaza? And we figure out with our Arab allies, Egypt, Saudi, Emiratis, Bahrainis, the Moroccans, let's, this is the way that we can figure out how to run and de de-radicalize Gaza and build a Palestinian paradise. Not a state necessarily, that's not from our perspective, from their perspective they want the beginnings of a state. Maybe we put a pin on what we call it yet, but maybe we, we figure that out, maybe. And maybe we have a decisive victory, or at least a, a victory good enough in the north. And maybe a year from now, Israel looks like the superpower. That we've gone from the bottom of the world against us, suddenly we have a deal, a true big deal with the Saudis, and, and our economy is taking off, our stock market is taking off, trade, tourism, technology, military cooperation against Iran with the Saudis and all the Arab world. Could that happen? Yes, it could. Out of the ashes of this war, could Israel become the most powerful and the most influential and successful country in the entire region, a true regional superpower? Yes. Might that set up the basis for Ezekiel 38 and 39? Yes, that's possible. So I think we just want to be careful when we look at Bible prophecy. One, we don't want to be clickbaity. We don't want to be sensationalistic. We need to be sober-minded because most, even Christians, don't listen to prophecy. They don't study prophecy. And when they hear prophecy, they get a little like, mm, this is going to be spooky. These people are from Area 51. They're from Roswell, New Mexico. I don't know. It seems a little weird. Right? That's most of Christendom doesn't think about prophecy, doesn't believe in prophecy. So as we teach it, those of us who know that it's scripture and know that it's real, we, we, let's just be sober-minded, thoughtful, prayerful. You do not have to convince a person of prophecy. You just teach it. They may think you're crazy. Okay. Let, let the Spirit take that enzyme and, and set into motion a catalytic in, environment, which it may be 10 years, 20 years later, where it goes, oh my gosh, that was true. I'll close with this thought. When Lynn and I first got married, it was the summer of 1990, and uh, one of the first, actually the second job that Lynn got in Washington, D.C., where we were living, was for Concerned Women for America, the biggest uh, pro-women, conservative, Christian, pro-life uh, women's organization in the United States. And of course, the leader of that, the founder, was Beverly LaHaye. So, and her husband was famously Dr. Tim LaHaye, one of the great Bible prophecy teachers of the 20th century, right? So Lynn was in charge of the national convention every year. And so we would move into the hotel in DC for a week where she was running the convention. And I didn't have anything to do. I mean, I, I was happy to be there. Now, if I'd been single, it might've been sound really exciting. Wow, 3,000 Christian women all in one building, fantastic. But I was very happy with my bride, I wasn't looking. So I just hung out with Dr. Tim LaHaye. And of course, he was a Bible prophecy expert. I had never met a Bible prophecy expert. My church didn't teach Bible prophecy when I was growing up. They didn't teach about Israel. They didn't take trips to Israel. That was too bad, but I survived. And so now I meet Tim LaHaye, and this is Tim LaHaye pre-left behind success. Just normal, wonderful, feisty, really interesting Tim LaHaye. Long story short, he's teaching me about Ezekiel 38 and 39. I'm like, okay, if you say so. Russia's a threat? I said, Dr. LaHaye, with respect, you know, me, I was like 25, right, or 23. With respect, the Soviet Union just imploded. Are you not watching the news? Do you really, you know, are you not paying attention to a million Jews are coming out of the Soviet Union? Like, what are you talking about? That Russia is going to be a threat to Israel, to the Jews? I think this is the greatest season in Russian-Jewish-Israel relations in, the, in, the, in history. And he would teach me, and he even gave me a book, uh, The Coming Peace in the Middle East. I'm like, okay. Inside, I'm going, okay, whatever. You're the expert. You know, I didn't really say it. I was trying. But I was like, okay, I really didn't see it. Then, fast forward, 10 years later, I'm working for Natan Sharansky, the former deputy prime minister of Israel, of course, former refusenik, nine years in the Soviet gulag, and KGB, and eventually the head of the Jewish agency. But at that time, I was working for him as a young media aide to him. And we're on a flight from Washington to New York, and we're just chatting, and he's asking about my background, my family escaping out of Russia, and all these things. And he gets talking about how 
It's so amazing. I said, did you ever imagine being the deputy prime minister of Israel? He said, he just laughed. He said, no, obviously I never did. But when I was, then prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, I need you, Natan, to go to Moscow and go meet with the head of the KGB, then called the FSB. And Natan was, you know, the way I recall it was something like, um, Bibi, I, I've done Moscow. I've done Russia. I've done the FSB. I, I don't really want to go back. He said, no, 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 you're the guy. I need to go. And, go, and, and Shransky said, asked him why. He said, because we have this file here. This file is full of evidence that the Russians are beginning to build an alliance with Iran. And they're selling nuclear technology. And they're helping Iran build a nuclear industry. And I, he goes, I'm worried, Bibi said. This Russian-Iranian alliance puts us in mortal danger. And you're the guy, Natan. You speak Russian. You know that system. You have respect there. Get on a plane. Go there and say, Mr. Putin, don't go there. So I finish up my, you know, a few months of assignment with Natan Sharansky, and I go home, and I'm like, honey, where's that book from 10 years ago? She's like, I don't know, maybe in the garage, in a box? And I'm just like, suddenly, this dormant thought from Dr. Tim LaHaye, like, one day, there's going to seem like there's peace, and then the Russians are going to build an alliance with Iran that's going to put us in mortal jeopardy. I'm like, bing, 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 bing. Like, what? But I got to read that again. I got to find that. I, I, I thought that man was crazy. Bless his heart. I know the Southerners in this room, they're like, bless your heart. That means you're an idiot, but you're just trying to say it nicely. <laughs> that man is dumb as a post. Bless his heart. That woman is ugly as sin. Bless her heart. Now, I'm a Northerner, so when I say bless your heart, I really mean it. But anyway, the point is, I really just didn't see it. But suddenly, this dormant thought, could that prophecy be real? Could that even be setting into motion in my lifetime? It started to come alive. And that set into motion for me, writing, becoming a novelist and writing the Ezekiel option and teaching about these things and, and so forth. So I just want us to be focused on Bible prophecy. I want us to look at what's happening here in Israel and in the region in light of Bible prophecy, but I don't want us to be crazy. Let's be sober minded, be thoughtful, lay things out for people like, look, this is what it says, this is what the texts say. This is what's happening. Let's watch to see what happens next. And let's ask ourselves, how should I live differently in light of what I'm seeing and in light of what could be coming breakfast? God bless. Thank you for listening to this episode about lessons from the prophet Amos. If you have found this podcast valuable, please be in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Are you someone who's searching for Jesus? We would love to talk to you about that. Do you have any question that you'd love Joel to answer in future podcasts? Please send comments that you might have to podcast at joshuafund.net. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on this episode that you'd like more information on. For the Joshua Fund ministry team, I'm Lynn Rosenberg, and thank you for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.